fear is for the long night, when the sun hides for years and children are born and live and die, all in darkness. That is the time for fear, my little lord, when the white walkers move through the woods. Thousands of years ago, there came a night that lasted a generation. Kings froze to death in their castles, same as the shepherds in their huts. And women smothered their babies rather than see them starve, and wept, and felt the tears freeze on their cheeks. In that darkness, the white walkers came for the first time. They swept through cities and kingdoms, riding their dead horses, hunting with their packs of pale spiders, big as hounds. What's going on ladies and gents, Joker back again, once again, and spoilers for Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 3. I think it's well established from my continuous reference to it that I'm a Game of Thrones fan. More so the books than the show, but I can turn my brain off from time to time and enjoy a good spectacle. Dragons flying into the stratosphere and John and Danny not passing out from low oxygen? Fine. John flying on the back of a dragon and not being ripped off from a parachute effect that his cape would cause? Fine. John and Danny having the upper arm strength to endure flying on the back of a dragon and not being ripped away by G-Force instead of, you know, making saddles for the dragons, which are actually in the lore? Fine. But then, you show me something stupid. Like, I don't know, sending a hundred thousand Dothraki to their death, and I just can't keep my brain turned off and enjoy. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go ahead and wind back to the start, to the beginning of episode three. So the episode starts with... Hold on, let me fix this. Simply amazing what one dude who has no clue what he's doing can do with Sony Vegas filters and playing with sliders. So our intrepid heroes are polishing off the last few moments before battle. Sam is late picking up his dragon glass weapons. Oh for fuck's sake. Took your time. Tyrion, for whatever reason, is not already in the crypts. Bran is not already in the godswood. Tyrion, and all non-essential personnel for that matter, like Sansa, not already being in the crypts, makes no logical sense. It's like going to a fallout shelter as the bombs are dropping on your head. The Night King could circumvent all of their defenses and just start burning down Winterfell at any time with his dragon. Sure, they trust that Jon and Danny will swoop in and stop the Night King, but then you potentially have three dragons fighting in, on, and over Winterfell. Simply put, all non-essential personnel should already be in the crypts. If that seems like a nitpick, it's not. What we see here is the start of a pattern. A pattern of incompetence and poor planning. As we'll see throughout the episode, no one is thinking about what they're fighting, or how they're fighting it. And I'm not even talking about the army of the undead. Our intrepid heroes are clearly not thinking about fighting zombies. Because if they were, we wouldn't have a hundred thousand Dothraki on the front lines without dragon glass weapons. No. I'm merely talking about fighting a superior force that outnumbers yours easily 10 or 20 to 1. If we go to the battle map shown in Season 8, Episode 2 for a moment, the best we can surmise is allied positions, because we have no idea how many people these tiles stand for. For example, there's 20 tiles for the Light Cavalry, but we know there's at least 100,000 riders. The Knights of the Vale appear in force during the Battle of the Bastards, and yet we only have 6 tiles for them. Five, if you want to say that top tile is just marking who's standing there. Also, the Knights of the Vale were heavy cavalry, and yet we see them all on foot. We see only two members of the Night's Watch, Sam and Lord Commander Ed. House Mormont has like 10 men at this point, and they're the ones guarding the gate. It's stated that the total fighting force of the North at the start of Game of Thrones is around 45,000, and Rob takes about 12,000 men south during the War of the Five Kings. Now, this is of course before various battles, sacrificing a portion of his forces at the Whispering Wood, and before things like the Red Wedding, the Battle of the Bastards, stuff like that. All the things that led us from the beginning of Game of Thrones to where we currently are. The Vale of Arryn also has a comparable fighting force of about 45,000. They never fought in the War of the Five Kings, but it's also unlikely that they brought all 45,000 of their forces to Winterfell. Still, I would argue that the Vale winterfell Alliance brings at worst 30,000 men to the table, at best 50,000 men to the table. Danny's Unsullied start at around 8,000, and yeah, a bunch died in Marine, but... I don't think it was that many, and there were also 5,000 boys who were still in training. And, at this point, they're probably ready for battle. I mean, fucking hell, 
If Arya can become an unkillable master assassin who can survive multiple stab wounds to the gut and not suffer any ill side effects from falling into literal shit water, and then wake up the next day pretty much fine and assassins creed her ass all over Bravos, and then fight a master assassin in single combat to death while injured in the dark, who has had all the same training, if not more than Arya, after what? three episodes of getting the shit beat out of her with a stick and being blind? I'm not saying, I'm just saying. If Arya can become one of the best fighters in all of the world after, what, three episodes? I'm gonna assume over the course of five seasons, 5,000 more Unsullied can be trained. I mean, it's not really a huge leap in logic. And hey, these ones get to keep their dicks. So we'll say for the sake of argument that the gathered forces at Winterfell is a conservative 163,000. On top of trying to figure out how large the army gathered at Winterfell is, you might be wondering why they're all outside the castle. Fair point. We'll just assume for the sake of argument that the castle cannot hold 163,000 soldiers. And the Dothraki fight on horseback, so I guess put them in the field? That said, you know what else the Dothraki are known for? They are some of the best archers in the world, and they're really, really good at firing bows while on horseback. But fuck it! Huh. Back to the idiot plan. So, what exactly were the 100,000 Dothraki doing? Like, what was the plan? Now that we know the lay of the land, and who's where, what was the actual plan? The Dothraki are sitting on the front lines, getting ready to charge, and they have... Iron Swords. Let's remember back to this scene. We can destroy them by burning them. And we can destroy them with dragon glass. So let me make sure I understand what's going on here. Someone, through some Herculean leap in logic that us mere mortals will never be able to comprehend, decided it would be a great idea. A wonderful idea, a fantabulous fucking idea, to send the bulk of the army, a hundred thousand-ish light cavalry, that just so happened to be really good archers, into head-on combat against a tidal wave of the undead, and they didn't think for one fucking moment to equip them with weapons to fight the fucking undead? And then Danny has the nerve, the gall, the audacity to get upset over their dying? Like, what? 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 What did you? How, how did you see that going? What did you expect to happen? How did that meeting even go? Did one of Danny's blood riders come up and they're like, "Yes, we will charge headlong into the darkness against a sea of the undead," and she signed off on it? And they all stood around the war council with several different leaders and air quote masterminds, and no one at any point had the self-awareness to say, hey, hum, mm, blood rider dude, not a great plan. Maybe, maybe, here's a, here's a thought, maybe you should take out your bows and your arrows and do strafing runs. Or if you're gonna run headlong into the darkness like suicidal idiots, at least take dragon glass weapons. I mean, sure, we'd all be better off keeping the bulk of you on the walls as archers firing volleys of dragon glass arrows and fire arrows into the hordes of the undead, but hey, fucking details. But no, this was the actual plan. Somebody proposed this plan, and everybody in the room said, yeah, that sounds like a great fucking idea. And then, when the plan goes sideways, like anyone with a working frontal cortex would have seen it going, Danny goes, oh shit, this was a bad fucking idea. And then, she flips out, stops waiting for the Night King, which was the original plan, bad plan as it was, and she's like, oh, well, I actually have to go save the tens of thousands of people who worship me like a goddess, who are dying by the aforementioned tens of thousands. Even if it was a stupid plan, which it is a stupid plan, she just abandons it immediately. It never once occurred to her that all her Dothraki would die, and you can tell this possibility clearly never crossed her mind. More so when she sent them out with the wrong fucking equipment. We can destroy them by burning them.
and we can destroy them with dragon glass. I mean, Danny was clearly at How to Kill White Walkers 101. Was she just not paying attention? Did she think that all the dragon glass that was being mined from her island and shipped north was for arts and crafts? Like, fuck. But we've clearly beaten this Dothraki Kalasar to death, so let's move forward. Let's talk about the trench. The trench is stupid. So first, how did John, sitting on the castle wall, watching the zombies get caught in the trench, not put two and fucking two together and go, hmm, hmm, perhaps I need to light the trench on fire. Maybe he just didn't know how to do it. I know how to do it. You know nothing, Jon Snow. But you know what? As bad and as stupid as that is, the trench in and of itself is rather stupid. It's only necessary because this is not Winterfell. That's right, ladies and gents, boys and girls, children of all ages, you heard me right. For you see, Winterfell is vastly more defendable than whatever the fuck this is. In fact, it's a point in the show and the books that Winterfell only gets taken through treachery whenever it's taken. Winterfell in the books is described as a huge castle complex spanning several acres defended by two massive walls of grey granite, with a wide moat between them. The outer wall is 80 feet high, the inner wall is 100 feet high, with a wide moat between them. Literally, in the books. If this zombie charge at the wall to build a half ass siege tower was what actually happened, the corpses would pile up the wall, 80 feet, and then they would fall into the moat. And perhaps, maybe, just maybe, if the moat was drained, then maybe, perhaps, it could have been filled with fire. Done. Zombie horde outsmarted. Literally, what would happen is your zombies would hit the 80 foot wall, fall into the moat, die in the fire, and there you go. Wham bam, thank you ma'am, because, duh. But Joker, what if they can't drain the moat? Okay, fine, fair enough. Maybe, just maybe, they can't drain the moat. Or maybe it's frozen over. In the case that it's frozen over, you literally have zombies falling 80 feet to hard ice. We know they break apart. So when the horde of zombies has gone over the 80 foot wall and they start piling up in the moat, just drop oil on them and then light the oil on fire. Look, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. It's almost like a zombie horde was the exact thing Winterfell was designed to defend against. You know, winter is coming and the north remembers and all of that jazz. And the castle being built like this would make taking the field even stupider. But again, fucking details. And before somebody says, But Joker, they never established that Winterfell had a moat in the show. So, they changed the eerie between season one and season four because reasons. But okay, fine. You know what? I'm a good sport. They need to protect not Winterfell. And the trench is the only option. So why is the infantry not behind the trench? After all, they are facing an enemy who just so happens to be weak to fire. We can destroy them by burning them. So, okay, building a burning ring of fire around not Winterfell, smart idea, fair enough. Hell, even if this was actual Winterfell, a burning ring of fire around the castle, not a bad idea, slows them down. And it would have probably been a good idea to build the burning ring of fire around the encampments outside of Winterfell just in case they were caught with their pants down. Which, had it not been for Tormund and crew, would have happened. How long do we have? Before the sun comes up tomorrow. So, they decided to build a trench, just barely around Winterfell, not in any strategical position where it would actually be useful. You know, like extending in front of the infantry, where it might serve to funnel the undead, should they breach it. Which they do. Side note, fire versus the undead, super inconsistent. One second, we get this. <laughs> then we get a handful lying down in a pit of fire and not 
combusting so that the other zombies can use them as a zombie land bridge. Super inconsistent. But okay, fine. The zombies who are extremely vulnerable to fire get past the burning ring of fire. Fine, whatever, not the stupidest thing to happen this episode. But I would have to imagine making the burning trench your last line of defense to guard a poorly thought out retreat at the cost of a couple thousand unsullied lives to guard your retreat might just be pretty up there. At least right up there with sending the bulk of your army out to battle against zombies with iron weapons that won't work. I mean, first, their best and last hope was that Danny or John would light it on fire. They had no backup plan. Second, the best retreat plan they could come up with required sacrificing a couple hundred, if not thousand, unsullied. What? It's literally a narrow passageway into the castle. They could have just, I don't know, held the pass like those historic dudes with spears and shields that they interlocked, kind of like the Unsullied do. And these dudes with spears and shields use this pass to invalidate the numbers of their opponents. But hey, details. Also, why did the Unsullied never actually use a phalanx? But back to the trench and how it should be in front of the infantry. Now, follow me on this. Imagine if you will. Instead of fighting a tidal wave of zombies, they were fighting a handful of zombies at a time. Sure, these zombies are walking over the zombie land bridges, but they're also being funneled. Funneled in a way that their numbers don't matter. Hmm, it's almost like that aforementioned example of using your terrain to invalidate your enemy's numbers. That, or they could have just used the real Winterfell, but hey, fucking details. On top of that, perhaps, riddle me this. Why is the artillery outside of the castle? Okay, I get it, TV set, but Winterfell is pretty big. Couldn't they just CGI them? Or maybe somebody could tell me why they're in front of the infantry? Or why they're only used twice? Why they're not lighting up the night with endless barrages of fire? You know, right alongside thousands of archers, firing fire arrows in the general direction of the zombie horde? I mean, you fire a couple thousand arrows, you're gonna hit something. But no, instead, we're gonna use some of our best archers to rush pointlessly to their death. Mind you, this is on top of not using the trench to funnel enemies, on top of having a really shitty retreat plan that cost the lives of hundreds if not thousands, because D&D forgot Winterfell had two huge ass walls with a wide ass moat between them. Or worse, they chose not to remember because lol, it looked cooler. Yes, because slaughtering a bunch of no-name people pointlessly in a battle you can barely see looks cool to someone, I'm sure. This battle plan is shit. It's in the show purely because A, Danny is currently pretty OP. If Cersei is going to be the final big bad, well, we need to call some of Danny's forces. Because even with the 20,000 from the Golden Company, Danny's Dothraki outnumber the Golden Company 5 to 1. And that's before we add the Unsullied and two dragons. On top of that, the Dothraki pose a narrative issue. What happens after the war? The Dothraki are not known for being farmers. They go from city to city, raping and pillaging. Sure, Dany is looked at like a goddess, but what's this warrior race gonna be doing in five to 10 years from now? Well, that's a hard question. And thankfully, now, D&D don't have to think about it. They literally killed off the problem, and B, to put our characters at a moronic disadvantage for dramatic effect, because it looks cool. Except, does it? You can barely see anything in the episode, and most, if not all of the action shots are close, zoomed in shots that cut away really quickly, or are so far away, like the Dothraki charge, that you can't see what's actually happening. And was anything ever in focus during this battle? Shaky cam, much cool, such authentic. And that brings us all the way to the plot. And the plot's involvement with the rest of the battle. So we have to rewind a bit and go back to Deus Ex Melisandre showing up. Had Deus Ex Melisandre not shown up, our intrepid heroes would have been even more fucked. Deus Ex Mel shows up, out of nowhere, walking straight through the White Walker lines after allegedly going to Volantis. So where will you go? 
Volantis. Good. If you don't mind my saying, I don't think you should return to Westeros. I'm not sure you'd be safe here. Oh, I will return, dear spider. One last time. My lady. I have to die in this strange country. Just like you. And when she went back to Volantis, she did fuck all. And I don't mean fuck all in the context of she fucked all to raise an army of shadow babies to bring them to Westeros. No, 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 no. I mean, she did fuck all. As in absolutely nothing. Like, I don't know, bring the fiery hand to Westeros, an order of fire mage warriors. 1,000 fire mage warriors. Now, you might think, okay, but Joker, like a thousand, a thousand warriors, like what's a thousand people going to do here? I don't think you are hearing the words that are coming out of my mouth if you're thinking that. I'm saying 1,000 fire mage warriors. 1,000 of them. 1,000 fire mage warriors. And let's be honest, it wouldn't just be the Fire Mage Warriors showing up. It would be everything from Fire Mage Warriors to Red Priests to Temple Prostitutes. All crammed together on whatever boats they can get their hands on because this war, this fight against the others, which is what they're actually called in the books, is the entirety of their religion. This is what their faith is built on. Also, they can bring people back from the dead. We've only seen two ever try it, and currently, they're batting a thousand. So there's no reason to believe that others couldn't do it. At least then, when it seemed like characters died over and over and over again, but they didn't, you're not yelling plot armor, you're yelling, well, I guess they brought the fire mages that can revive people. It's a cop-out, but at least it makes sense. But no, we get Melisandre and only Melisandre. Okay, well, you know what? Maybe in the next episode, she can explain to us why she was the only member of her religion to come fight the battle that her entire religion is built around fighting. Oh. Oh, wait. No, she can't. Anyways, back to something that resembles the plot. Had it not been for Melisandre, the Dothraki would have been charging into battle without flaming swords. Just iron. And it feels like I'm harping a lot on that one point, but that was a hundred thousand soldiers that just got sent in with weapons that don't work against the enemy they're fighting. I, I, I just, it just, we're already starting in a bad place. But Melisandre does more than just give our Dothraki warriors more than an ice cube's chance in hell. She also sets fire to the trench because they had no backup plan before Melisandre arrived, and she feeds our resident assassin a vital piece of information, but we'll get to that in a moment. That said, all in all, Mel, MVP of this episode, but taking a diversion from our lovely deus ex fire priestess, we get to the crypts, the crypts of Winterfell. I don't know what's more stupid. The fact that they played into the expectations? I mean, come on. When you say the crypts are safe like 900 times in an episode, they're clearly not safe. Or they are safe and you're subverting expectations. Here, they clearly weren't safe, which was the expectation. And it was kind of a stupid expectation when you start to break it down. So the crypts of Winterfell are not a dry place. They're quite damp, actually. This is likely due in large part to the natural hot spring Winterfell sets on. More on that later. Essentially what I'm getting at is within a year, the skin would rot off the bones of the dead, and within 20 to 30 years, they would turn to dust. The most recent additions to the crypt would be Rickard Stark, Ned's father, Ned Stark, Lyanna Stark, Ned's sister, Brendan Stark, Ned's older brother, and Rickon Stark, Ned's youngest son. Ned, Lyanna, Brandon, and Rickard Stark all died in the south. Rickard Stark was burnt to death by the Mad King, so realistically, how much of him was left to return to Winterfell? Ned, Lyanna, and Brandon would have all been likely tended to by the Silent Sisters, 
which means that their bodies were disassembled, boiled down until it was nothing but bones, put in a medium-sized box, and sent back up north. So, realistically, the only zombie breaking out that makes sense would have been Rickon. Now, the dead rising from the crypts of Winterfell is actually kind of an old theory. It starts from the idea that, according to tradition, iron longswords are placed across the laps of each lord to keep the vengeful spirits within the crypts. But the idea is more like Lord of the Rings spirits rising to help the living, and not the walking dead breaking free to kill a few extras. Also, how are skeletons punching through solid stone? <gasps> the main reason that this doesn't really sit well with me is because Winterfell was built by Brandon the Builder, the same guy who built the Wall and Storm's End. And he used Children of the Forest magic in his construction of these buildings. The entrance of the crypts is in the oldest section of Winterfell, near the foot of the First Keep. And Brandon most certainly would have had the others in mind when building Winterfell. As the lore states, Brandon built Winterfell after a generation-long winter, known as the Long Night. In that darkness, the White Walkers came for the first time. They swept through cities and kingdoms, riding their dead horses, hunting with their packs of pale spiders, big as hounds. And Brandon had the foresight to build Winterfell over our natural hot spring. So, given all of that, it's highly unlikely that Sansa and friends weren't an awarded place, given that the crypts and Winterfell itself seem to be designed as a long night fallout shelter. So, essentially what I'm getting at is it should have played out more like this. And less like this. And if we continue along the line of reasoning that looks at the evidence presented in the books that Winterfell is some sort of post-Long Night fallout shelter created just in case the Long Night ever happens again, why would you put the dead in your fallout shelter when your enemy can raise the dead unless they were meant to be some sort of weapon or guard why must there always be a stark in winterfell it just doesn't make any sense that the dead in the crypts would come into play unless it's on the side of the living i don't think dan and dave's ending is going to be that different from my ending because of the conversations we we did have but they may be on certain secondary characters there may be big differences if you're handed notes on how the end ends you don't turn around and say, We hope to kind of avoid the expected, and Jon Snow has always been the hero, the one who's been the savior, but it just didn't seem right to us for this, for this moment. Unless none of this has anything to do with the way the story ends, none of it's remotely in the source material, and it's all just poorly written fan fiction. Now, to be fair, the Night King isn't a character in the books. So, to have Arya kill him doesn't invalidate any John is Azor High, John is the prince that was promised. It doesn't invalidate any of those prophecies, per se. That being said, beware of prophecies because it'll bite your dick off every time. And we're told this multiple times throughout the story in the books. The closest analog that we have for a Night's King in the lore is the Knight's King, who was the 13th Lord Commander of the Knight's Watch. He fell in love with a woman with skin as white as the moon and eyes like blue stars. He chased her and he loved her, though her skin was as cold as ice. And when he gave her his seed, he gave her his soul as well. The Knight's King brought her back to the Knight Fort, and after their unholy union, he declared himself king and her his queen and ruled the Night Fort as his own castle for 13 years. During the dark years of his reign, horrific atrocities were committed, of which tales are still told in the North. It wasn't until Brandon the Breaker, the King of Winter, and Joramin, the King Beyond the Wall, joined forces that the Night's King was brought down and the Night's Watch was freed. After his fall, when it was discovered that the Night's King had been making sacrifices to the others, all records of him were destroyed, and his very name was forbidden and forgotten. But that doesn't mean that the others don't have an avatar or a leader. The children of the forest have green seeders that they plug into weirwood.net like Bloodraven or Bran. There's the prince that was promised, there's Azor High, 
there's all of these mythical figures. Plus, you just have basic ruling and command structures. And from what we see at the beginning of Game of Thrones in the very first chapter, the prologue chapter, the others do seem to have some kind of command structure or at least a leader. The others can fight, they can hunt people down, they can make deals for babies, they can hunt people down when they kidnap those babies. So some sort of leader or command structure wouldn't be weird. Maybe the other that was promised. So my issue isn't with the Night King's existence. Fine, fair enough, a leap in logic. Hell, I'll even pass on bitching about how when they kill the Night King, all of his minions die. Like it's some sort of video game. And Arya killing the Night's King isn't really the most egregious thing, though I do think it's unearned. We still have an entire story to go through, Bran could still be the bad guy, and Jon could still fulfill prophecy. What does annoy me is the show logic used to justify Arya killing the Night King, and how that kill is unearned. I see a darkness in you. And in that darkness, eyes staring back at me. Brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes. Eyes you'll shut forever. We will meet again. This meeting never happens in the books. It was created for the TV show so they could combine the story of Gendry and Edric Storm, two of Robert Baratheon's bastards. The closest thing that we get in the books is from an old albino dwarf, maybe child of the forest wood witch named the Ghost of Highheart when she meets Arya and she says, I see you, I see you, wolf child, blood child. I thought it was the Lord who smelled of death. You are cruel to come to my hill, cruel. I gorged on grief at Summer Hall. I need none of yours. Be gone from here, dark heart. Be gone. So kind of the same if you look at it in the context of Arya has this dark place in her heart, left by all the people she loved that died, and she's going to get revenge. She has her list. And I think originally that's what this encounter was, a reference to the ghost of High Heart. You said I'd shut many eyes forever. You were right about that too. Brown eyes. Green eyes. And blue eyes. Brown eyes. Blue eyes. Green eyes. I don't think Dan and Dave's ending is going to be that different from my ending. So Arya goes and kills an amalgamation of a character that may or may not appear in the books based on a prophecy Dan and Dave pulled out of their asses for the TV show, while simultaneously ignoring the prophecies in the books. Which, hey, if the prophecies in the books don't come true, that's almost kind of the point. Prophecy, as we've outlined before, tends to bite your dick off. But here's the thing, hypothetically speaking. If the Night King's not a character and Arya killing him doesn't actually matter and there's no prophecy and all this Arya stuff is actually filler, then what? We just wasted a bunch of time for Bran to come out and go, But it was I, Dio! I don't think Dan and Dave's ending is going to be that different from my ending. Yeah, I'm calling shenanigans. Okay, but fine. This is the story we have. How much sense does it make? Arya's story is about revenge, about killing those that wronged her and her family. Arya's story has nothing to do with the Night King, the Great Other, and the Great War. Maybe, just maybe, you might be able to somehow stretch that the Faceless Men might serve the Great Other because they serve a Death God, and learning from the Faceless Men somehow connects Arya to the Great Other in the Battle for the Dawn. But that's going to be a hard sell. Nothing like that is ever broached in the show. Hell. Only the inklings that the Faceless Men are probably up to something are approached in the books. In the show, they're just assassins with a twist. And as it stood in the show before this episode, Arya had no connection with this plot. Arya is alive and currently the person she is, in large part because Jon gave her Needle. And that gave her a lot of confidence, a lot of agency. Had it not been for Needle, she would have never been trained by Serio Pharrell. Had it not been for Needle, she would have been captured by the stable boy in the first season. Needle repeatedly is there to give her confidence. And in the books, even when she's at the House of Black and White, she thinks about Needle. She thinks about Jon all the time. So if you want to have this come full circle and have Jon and Arya's plot come together, and you want to have Arya kill the Night King, you give everyone the 1v1 with Jon and the Night King that they've been teasing since Hardhome, and Jon just gets overwhelmed. Arya comes in, last minute, and helps Jon defeat the Night King. You can either have both of them do it, so it's like, yes, both of everybody's favorite characters did it, or you can just have Arya do it, and hey, she saved Jon. 
we come full circle because she wouldn't be there without John. But without that John element there, you have what? Arya coming out of nowhere and killing the Night King? When you try to subvert expectations like D&D admit they're trying to do here, we hope to kind of avoid the expected and Jon Snow has always been the hero, the one who's been the savior, but it just didn't seem right to us for this for this moment. The subversion has to make sense, narratively speaking. Ned Stark dying at the end of season one is a subversion on the hero trope because the hero's not supposed to die, not at the beginning of the story. And yet, that's exactly what should have happened, realistically speaking. So, a good subversion has to be logical. It has to be set up within the narrative. Arya killing the Night King just wasn't earned. More so on the part of the writers than on the part of Arya. Because, think about it, they set up this story. Jon Snow has been the man on the ground since the beginning. His story's been about the War for the Dawn since the moment he joined the Night's Watch. He joined the Night's Watch. He went north of the Wall. He infiltrated the Wildlings, came back to the Night's Watch, was treated like a traitor. He made peace with Mance Raider and the Wildlings. He was elected Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Even though Stannis Baratheon was willing to give Jon everything he ever wanted, name him Jon Stark, legitimize him, make him Lord of Winterfell, Warden of the North. And yet he gave that up for the Night's Watch because the War for the Dawn was more important. And then members of the Night's Watch betrayed him, stabbed him to death. And then he was brought back. For what? So he can have a pissing contest with his aunt? who he's having sex with over who gets to sit in the uncomfortable pointy chair? A chair that John doesn't give a fuck about? That comes with a crown John doesn't give a fuck about? That's tied to an identity John doesn't give a fuck about? The type of character John is, he'd be more than thrilled to hook up with Danny, marry her because it would solve everything, and let her rule. So this Targaryen succession crisis drama just doesn't make sense and it really devalues the characters in the story. If John's King of the North, if John is the Warden of the North, if John is Aegon fucking Targaryen, rightful ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, protector of the yada yada yada, guardian of the yada yada yada, titles, titles, titles. Any of these titles would make him more than fitting to be the husband to the Queen. If he's King of the North, well, then you bring the realm together. If he's just Warden of the North, well, he has a lofty enough title and still controls half of Westeros. If he's Aegon Targaryen, well, then he's the actual king, so it doesn't matter and he can marry whoever he wants. And if that just so happens to be the daughter of the Mad King, well, stranger things have happened. This is such a non-issue that I have no clue why they've made Jon's story about this, when his story was about the War for the Dawn. And yet he gets shafted when it comes to ending the War for the Dawn, and as a consolation prize, he gets a Targaryen succession crisis that he has no investment in. What? That's not good writing. That's not good storytelling. That's asinine. And short of some plot twist in episode 4, where the War for the Dawn actually isn't over, and Bran comes out and he's like, Ha ha! But it was I, Dio! Then the story has devolved into what exactly? John, Danny, and Cersei trying to murder fuck each other over a pointy chair? Cersei being the endgame just feels so shallow, so small, so petty. Because ultimately, this isn't just about the writers trying to subvert expectations by having Arya kill the Night King. Sure, it really does feel like Jon's story was shafted and now his whole thing is a Targaryen succession crisis, which he's not invested in. But they dealt with the War for the Dawn in one episode, one fucking episode. The thing that the series has been building up since the beginning. The first thing we see in the series, even before the title credits. The thing we see before Ned and Rob and John and Bran. Before anything. The threat that everyone else in the world but John and the Wildlings and people north of the Wall have been ignoring. That gets stopped in one anticlimactic battle. Really? The War of the Dawn, the apocalypse, that we've all been warned about since the beginning of the series, ends like a wet fart. And our biggest concerns are Cersei and a succession crisis, short of, again, some plot twist where Bran is actually ancient evil from yada 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 yada. If Cersei ends up being the big bad, that means the 20,000 members of the Golden Company, the Gold Cloaks, Euron's fleet, and whatever Lannister forces are left, plus a stockpile of wildfire that has been hinted at since wildfire was introduced, will end up being more of a challenge for our intrepid heroes 
than an army of dead numbering in the hundreds of thousands, the others who can control the weather, and a fuck-mothering zombie dragon. I realize I'm repeating myself a bit here, but that would just feel so small, so shallow, so empty. Ultimately, my issue isn't really with Arya killing the Night King. My issue is with how it was set up, how it was executed. Sure, it really isn't her story and it really shouldn't have been her kill, but fine, whatever. The bigger issue, honestly, is that the Night King was killed at all. Even if Jon got the killing blow, I still would have felt it was kind of weak. Because that's it. That's the long night. That's what we've been fearing since the beginning of the series. Okay. And I guess the quest for the Iron Throne really was the only thing that mattered. How fucking droll. Were there other issues with this episode? Yes, I could go on and on and on and on. But really, all of that pales in comparison to what this episode could mean for the rest of the series. And not just the rest of the series, because mind you, this is supposed to be somehow, some way, somewhere in the neighborhood of how the books are supposed to end. At least allegedly. And... That would be kind of disappointing. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. And like always, stay frosty.